All right, church, you may have a seat. As Sam mentioned, what a, um, what a joy it is to gather. What a great delight it is to sing. I feel like, um, I know that I'm not singing better. That's not what's happening. It's the church that's singing better. But you actually make me sound like I can sing. So I'm so grateful for you lifting up your voices and doing it in unison. Um, the Lord is deserving of that praise. Well, hey, we're turning back to uh, the book of Philippians. And so if you have a copy of the scriptures, you want to grab that and turn to chapter 4. We are really nearing the close. In fact, there's just a few more messages uh, on the book of Philippians. But this morning, we will continue our conversation about contentment. And we, every week, uh, want to focus the, the main message of uh, the text is, is coming from the text. And so the, the point of the text should be the point of the sermon. And I trust that uh, the Lord has something helpful for us in store this morning. But you remember last Lord's Day, we talked in depth about Christian contentment. And so maybe I can begin with just asking, how did your week go? Do you feel like uh, after Sunday, maybe you were a little bit more uh, contented, thinking about contentment much more throughout the week? I know I had uh, some questions come to me uh, from my own brain, but from my family when I was expressing discontent. And so that's one of the things that when you preach on a topic, you've got people who keep you accountable to actually obey the topics that you're teaching on. But you remember that as we looked at verse 10 there, we talked about contentment coming as a form of gratitude, that contentment is a fruit of gratitude. And then as we looked uh, there in verses 11 and 12, we learned that contentment is actually a spiritual discipline, something that is learned, something that is practiced. And then we ended our time last week on verse 13. And just to remind you, contentment truly is resting in Christ's sufficiency. So Paul tells us that it really is, a, it's a character quality, it's something that's learned, it's not something that we're born with, it's not a spiritual gift, it's not something that comes naturally, but it is a vital Christian virtue that needs to be nurtured and grown. And we also said oftentimes it's cultivated despite our circumstances. We also said last week that uh, contentment oftentimes grows in the soil of suffering. The way that we're to progress in our contentment is when we truly trust in God through trial. And so even as we sing these songs, it is well with my soul. We're reminded of the difficulty that we're currently going through, difficulty that we have been involved in, and maybe the difficulty that's ahead of us that we can't see and if we are to be content, then we have to cling on to God and the gospel. But this is how contentment comes. Trusting in God's goodness, trusting in his sovereignty, trusting in his providence, trusting that he's in control. And not only that, but trusting that he's made promises to us that are unbreakable. So God is a God that does not lie. When he says something, he means that and he will follow through on the things that he says. And understanding that grounds us. It helps us. To be content when we're abounding, it helps us to be content when we're abased. We can find perfect contentment through the Lord who strengthens us. And so contentment then, it comes to the Christian who has confidence in God despite circumstances. It comes to those who trust in God's sovereign providence. We can be satisfied Him in any situation. We can depend on Him because He provides divine enablements. Of all the people on earth, we should be the ones that have and experience peace and rest because we have an unalterable and unchangeable God. But the question now this morning, after examining all that last week, is if we possess this contentment, if we've discovered the secret, if we've learned about all of contentment in the previous verses, then... What comes next? If you truly trust in God's sovereignty and sufficiency, then how will all this trust and abiding and confidence and contentment, how will it ultimately manifest itself? 
And I would suggest that one of the clearest indicators of Christian contentment is complete unselfishness and preoccupation with God and with others. You see, Christian contentment should remove me from the center of the universe, as Sam was just talking about, and should create a consuming passion for Christ and for other people. That is what contentment should do. We feel it, we sense it, we have it, but what does it look like? How is it played out? We cannot be content, church, if we're only concentrating on ourselves. No, contentment will manifest itself in a concern for others. And this is exactly what we see the Apostle Paul focusing his attention on. He has this all-consuming passion for the Lord, and he has a longing to see the church built up. He said back in chapter 1 and verse 9, he says, And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more in full knowledge in all discernment. And then in chapter 2 and verse 3, he reminds us, do nothing from selfish ambition or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, we are to do what? We are to regard others as more important than ourselves, not merely looking out for your own interest, but also for the interest of others. And that right there is the attitude of Christ. Perfectly content, perfectly at peace, enjoying the fellowship of the Father and the Spirit. And what did he do? He acted. He came to the earth. He humbled himself. He became a servant, and he gave. This is the attitude that Paul prayed the Philippians would have, and it's the attitude that God wants us to have. And so all throughout the letter, he's praising them for this attitude. He's exhorting them to continue in this attitude. Live for others. Give toward others. Lay down your life for others. If we're concerned about the spiritual good of others, then that is when we are most like Christ. So now as we get close to the close of the letter, Paul's going to provide for us a few characteristics of Christian contentment. So we can say this is how someone should feel when they're content, and this is now what someone who's content does. This is how he should live, how she should live. So let's read Philippians 4 and starting in verse 14. Paul writes this, Nevertheless, you have done well to fellowship with me in my affliction. And you yourselves also know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel after I left Macedonia, no church fellowship with me in the matter of giving and receiving, but you alone For even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. Not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek the fruit which increases to your account. But I have received everything in full and have an abundance. I've been filled, having received from Epaphroditus, which you have sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. Oh, Father, would you please help us now in this hour to... Understand your truth, to submit to it, to love it, to obey it, to muse on it, so that it would produce worship pleasing to you, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Our main idea for this morning in this section here is real simple. In verses 14 through 18, Paul provides us with three characteristics of generous giving that spring from Christian contentment. One more time, Paul provides us with three characteristics of generous giving that spring from Christian contentment. And the way that we're outlining this is just three points. First, we'll look at verses 14 through 16, and we'll see that Christian uh, contentment produces friendly fellowship. Friendly fellowship. And then in verse 17, we'll see that it produces fruitful stewardship. And then lastly, we'll focus our attention on that last point, which is fragrant worship. And so when we look at verses 14 through 16, there's an inseparable relationship between financial support and gospel partnership. And when we think about fruitfulness, there's a spiritual and eternal blessing that comes as a result of our generous giving. And there's also a lifestyle of worship that brings pleasure to God through our sacrificial giving. So let's start here, point number one, friendly fellowship. Now, Paul begins with an explanation regarding the gift. 
And he begins with this word, nevertheless. And I want to focus here just for a second because we use that word nevertheless typically to counter an idea or to clarify a previous thought. And that's exactly what Paul is doing. He wants to make sure that the Philippian church didn't get the wrong message with what he's just said. Right? Remember the context. Paul, he's a prisoner. He's under house arrest in Rome. His conditions are nothing like the conditions of a modern prison. The Roman government is not footing the bill. It's not free room and board. No, Paul has needs. They're not feeding him. They're not providing medical care for him. Their, their mentality is if he dies, he dies. He, he might die anyway once the verdict comes back and says, chop off his head. And so Paul is there in this prison. He's chained to his soldiers 24-7, and he's awaiting the determination about his life. And so when the Philippian church catches word that Paul is in prison, what do they do? Well, they send a brother to meet his needs. I mean, after all, Paul planted the church. He was the pastor of the church 10 years ago. And the Philippians want to meet this brother's need. And so they find Epaphroditus, a member of the church, a faithful member. And he makes that arduous and dangerous 800 plus mile trek all the way from Philippi to Rome. And he finally arrives and we discussed this earlier that he may have even potentially got deathly sick on the way, but he continues to make his way to Paul. He walks through the door and he provides Paul with a sweet gift. Money, supplies, maybe food, maybe clothing, maybe some books. We don't really know all the details of what the Philippians gift entailed, but what we do know is that it was an extremely generous gift. And we know it's generous because Paul alludes to that in our text. But we also know that the gift was extremely generous because the church in Philippi didn't have much. You say, well, how do we know that? Well, Paul mentions this. The church in Philippi was one of the churches in Macedonia. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, we're told that the churches of Macedonia were marked by deep poverty. It's the kind of reputation they had. And they were tested with great affliction. And so we know that they didn't have much, but what they did have, they actually gave sacrificially to Brother Paul. And now in response, Paul, he sends Epaphroditus, who's now fully regained his health. They, he sends him back to Philippi with this personal, joy-filled thank you note. And even though it's a short letter, it's filled with love and joy and some of the highest Christology. And Epaphroditus has the letter from Paul and he gives it to the elders there in Philippi. And this is what they read. In verse 11, I do not speak from want. He says, I am content. He says, I know how to get along with humble means. He says, I've learned the secret of contentment. He says, I know how to get by even with extreme hunger and suffering. He says, even though I am suffering need, he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And you now have to sit there thinking about being a member in the congregation, hearing these things, and your first thought is, that's fantastic. Your second thought is, what a godly guy. I probably am never going to be like that. But here's your third thought, maybe. Well, wait a second. If Paul's content and he's learned to deal with difficulty and circumstances, then was it really necessary for us to, to take this offering and to risk our brother's life to make him go all the way over there to give this gift? I mean, if God is going to provide for Paul, then why in the world did we go through all the trouble of sending this gift to Brother Paul in prison? You see, they're acting on faith. They're giving generously. And it seems like Paul's saying, well, I really don't need your gift because God is my strength and my provision and my supply and he makes me content. And if the letter would have just stopped in verse 13, what started off as just a joyous letter would have been a jolt. Well, wait a second. This does not make sense. Was Paul truly thankful or was he not? Were they really helping him or were they not? 
Were they being led by the Spirit to give and to give generously, or were they not? All jam-packed in one word, we find the answer. Paul says, nevertheless. I just said this, but nevertheless. It's extremely important because what he's doing here is he's wisely, intentionally reminding them that, yes, he's trusting in God's sovereignty. Yes, he's trusting in God's sufficiency. Yes, he's trusting in the strength that comes from God alone. And yet, he is so extremely thankful. He's got great gratitude and appreciation. And so he says, in spite of all that, in spite of my contentment, nevertheless, in spite of the fact that I'm strengthened by Christ, in spite of the fact that God is always providing for me and meeting my needs, you Philippians, you have done well. Look there at the excellence of their giving. Paul uses that word kalos, which is just a way to say you've done extremely well. In 1 Corinthians 11.4, that word is translated, you've done beautifully. In Galatians 4.17, it's commendably. In Hebrews 13.18, it's honorably. And so what Paul is saying here is the gift that you've sent, this is a, this is a very noble thing. It's a, it's a beautiful thing what you've done to minister to my needs. And notice that Paul doesn't say that they did well in giving him money. That's not what he says. Look at what he says in the text. He says, you have done well to fellowship with me in my affliction. There's a difference there. The idea here is that the Philippians were partners with Paul in ministry. And the word that's used here is fellowship. We've talked about this before. It's the word soon, which together and koinonia, or the verb for that, means we're partnering alongside. That is what Paul is saying. You've partnered with me. And you think about this church. The reason why they sent Epaphroditus to Paul is because they didn't want him to feel alone. They feel. They empathize. They're imagining what he must be going through. They know the kind of weight that he's under. They know that he's risked his life. In fact, that's how they met Paul, didn't they? When he was beaten and bruised in Philippi. All to get the gospel to them. They knew that his resources would be depleted. They knew that his clothes would become tattered. They know that his body is bruised. They know that his hunger is increasing. They know that his encouragement might be low. And so what do they do? They want to give him a boost. That's what fellowship is. It's not just enjoying a potluck. I love Sunday evenings. It's fantastic. But just hanging out and eating, that is not necessarily all that fellowship is. Sometimes fellowship means giving sacrificially through finances. Sometimes it's praying. Sometimes it's letters of encouragement. Sometimes it's just other practical, tangible ways to support gospel work. When we think about fellowship, when we do the meal train, that is fellowship. The benevolence fund, that is fellowship. Supporting Josh and all the brothers who go out and do evangelism, that is fellowship. See, the Philippians were right there with Paul, despite the distance. They're partners with Paul in the provision, in prayer, in progressing the gospel, and their love gift was an evidence of their commitment to gospel partnership with Paul. So let me just pause right here and ask you, brothers and sisters, are you partnering with this local church to advance the gospel? Is that your heartbeat? And not just this church, it's not the only church. We, we mentioned in our prayers, there's other churches that are gathering on the peninsula and in our state and across our country. There's other great ministries. Are you partnering with other ministries to get the gospel out? Are you a co-contributor to making much of God through local churches? Uh, turn with me real quickly to the letter of 3 John. Toward the back of the Bible, 3 John Jude, Revelation. But uh, let's take a look at this very short New Testament epistle. And there's a commendation here that Brother John gives to Brother Gaius that I think is helpful. There in the letter of 3 John, we read this, verse 1, The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that in all respects you may prosper and be in good health just as your soul prospers. 
For I rejoice greatly when brothers came and bore witness to your truth. That is how you're walking in truth. Look what he says in verse four. I have no greater joy than this to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Beloved, you are acting faithfully in whatever work you do for the brothers. And you're doing this through, though they are strangers, and they bore witness to your love before the church, you will do well to send them on your way in a manner worthy of God. For they went out for the sake of the name, receiving nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support such men so that we may be fellow workers with the truth. Just a short, brief letter, all commending a brother for his active, generous, sacrificial engagement to advance the gospel. And the same could be said for the Philippians who supported Paul. Now, what I also love about Paul's commendation here is that he tells them specifically what he's thankful for. It says here in the text that he came, they came through again and again for him. They're just not one-time partners. They're ongoing ministry supporters. Look there at verse 15. He says, And you yourselves also know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel after I left Macedonia, no church fellowship with me in the matter of giving and receiving, but you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. And here what we have is an example of their giving. Paul says right there in the text, that this happened at the first preaching of the gospel. And what I think Paul means by that is that from day one, they were all in. It didn't take long. Once they put on the jersey, I'm team Jesus forever. And I'm going to do whatever it takes to help our team see through the victory. They didn't postpone their provision until they matured. They didn't wait until they finished a theology class. They didn't wait till they went on their first missionary journey. No, it says here from day one, they were committed to supporting the gospel work. And isn't that true? What happened to Lydia? The Holy Spirit opens up her heart. She gets saved. And what does she do? We're going to have a grace group in my house. And she opens up her home and they do a Bible study there. And then there's the Philippian jailer. As soon as he is converted, he's baptized. He washes Paul and Silas's wounds. He brings them to his crib. He feeds them. And then he invites everyone there so they could hear the gospel and be saved as well. And that is the Great Commission. You believe the word. You're baptized. You learn to obey all that Jesus commanded. And then we go and do the same thing to other people. There was a long history of this gospel partnership with the church, and it was continually expressed through the Philippians' sacrificial giving. And so that's what we see here in this text. Paul was extremely thankful for the Philippians. I'm extremely thankful for the Philippians. You should be extremely thankful for the Philippians because it was the work that they supported for the gospel to reach the rest of Europe and ultimately where? Over here. And to you and to me, it was their work of supporting the apostles' gospel ministry that allowed us to get the gospel. Now, why were the Philippians the only church that established an ongoing partnership with the Apostle Paul? That's bewildering to me. I don't understand that. I just don't. And I don't know that I'll ever be able to answer that question. But the question has to be raised is, did these other churches not know about the need? Do they not know about the circumstances? Do they not know ways that they contribute? I don't know, but what we do know is that the Philippians were the ones that were faithful for a decade, a decade. When my daughter's 10, for the, the entirety of her life, they were praying and they were providing for the Apostle Paul. And look, they just weren't providing. It says that they were doing it consistently and immediately. Look there at uh, verse 15. It says, No church fellowship with me in the matter of giving and receiving, but you alone. And what Paul does here is he uses these three business terms. And what he's saying is the Philippians, they were investing wisely. Their monetary support to Paul was recorded up in heaven. God knows exactly what they gave and the heart they gave it with. 
And it's producing an eternal reward. Look at verse 16. For even in Thessalonica, you sent the gift more than once for my needs. In Acts 16 and 17, we learn that after Paul and Silas are in Philippi, they leave and they make this 92-mile journey to Thessalonica. And you know what follows them on their journey? The Philippians' pocketbook. Because as they're going on this road to try to plant more churches, the church in Philippi says, well, you're going to need some help. And we want to support you. So they sent money right after those brothers who are planting churches. And the word even that Paul uses here suggests that he was pleasantly surprised. For you even sent for more than once for my needs. Not only were they prompt, but the church was aggressive. So it wasn't a one-time thing. It was an ongoing thing. They gave immediately. They gave repeatedly. They gave joyfully. They were overflowing with generosity. And let me just remind you one more time, they were not a wealthy church. It was an outstanding, long-standing partnership. You see, people who possess Jesus will be content, and that contentment will express itself in friendly fellowship. We'll partner with others in gospel ministry. And this leads to our second point. The second characteristic of Christian contentment is the fruitful stewardship that contentment produces. Look there at verse 17. Paul writes this, Not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek the fruit which increases to your account. And this is the second time now that Paul has to use this phrase, not that. It's a qualification. He said something similar back in Philippians 4.11. Not that I speak from want. And he says here, not that I seek the gift itself. You see, he's working hard to not be misunderstood. Next week, I'm going to teach on giving. You say, Dom, how many times have you taught on giving here at this church? Well, next week will be the first. This might be the first. But we don't do that very often here. But we know that's a problem. I see it all over Twitter. I see it, uh, I hear it from people who talk about how they've been gypped, how they've been fleeced. We know prosperity preachers love to preach on money. But does that dissuade Paul here from talking about money? The answer to that is absolutely not. Why? Because it's biblical. And look at what he says here. That the word is seek and expresses this idea of serious interest or intense desire. He wants to make abundantly clear that his main interest is not money. It wasn't primarily financial support. And yet, there's a real practical sense in which we know that the Lord uses the gifts of others to support ministry. And so what's Paul going to do here? What's he going to say when you read several commentaries, you'll, you'll find out that they're saying things like, man, Paul has got to be extra careful here, talking about money. He's walking this tightrope of Christian tact and Christian courtesy when it comes to the issue of money. But I don't think he's concerned about all that. He's just telling the truth. He's depending on the Lord, but he's also depending that it's through other people that that is how the Lord will provide. Look there at the text. He says, not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek the fruit which increases to your accounts. You see the, the strong contrasting word there, but. You see, the goal for him is not getting more. His aim is not to acquire wealth. His gratitude overflows, not for the amount they give, but for the growth they experience in their giving. He essentially says, look, I'm not coming to you because I need a bankroll. I'm coming to you because I want you to experience blessing. And he uses that word here, carpon, fruit. Your translation might say profit. He wants us to think about our generous giving and our investments like a spiritual investment portfolio. I have a friend who... Um, did something, I don't know when this was, in the 90s. But he put a lot of money in some unknown company called Amazon. 
Uh, I think this is the wealthiest guy that I know. He doesn't know what to do with his money. It just keeps coming in and coming in and coming in. You'd say, well, that was a pretty awesome investment. Yeah, but he didn't know that. We Christians have a sure deal here. We know that when we invest in heaven, there's a huge payback. There are huge rewards when we invest in things that are eternal. But the question is, do we have to wait till we get to heaven to enjoy and to see this this investment pay its dividends? Obviously, we know that Paul is not talking about earthly increase or materialism. That's not what Paul's mind is. So the increase that Paul is talking about here, we know, is it's spiritual. I guess the question to us is, is that exciting? Is that thrilling? The, the spiritual investment that we're making, is, does, that, does that make you want to invest more? Paul, he often referred to converts as fruits. He often referred to the righteous change that takes place in a believer, as fruit. In the parable of the sower and the seed, Christ gave that explanation, you remember, of the good ground. There it says, and the one whom seed was sown on the good soil, this is the man who hears the word, understands the word, who indeed bears fruit and brings forth some hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. And I think this is what Paul is saying. He's saying, Philippians, look, your investment, your financial investment in this gospel ministry, it has produced converts. They had no idea. They're long gone. That fruit, that work is recorded in the pages of Scripture, and we're actually reading it right now. People have got saved because the book of Philippians was written. You think about this church, this impoverished church giving to this mission, and now we've got the Word of God, and look at the ripple effect that's taken place. Do they have any idea? They do now, because they're in glory, but they still don't know fully what their investment paid out. So Paul wants them to understand that he's grateful for their gift, but the motivation for giving is not guilt. He's not trying to guilt them. God doesn't want us giving begrudgingly or compulsively, Uh, It's true that it's a privilege to give, but more than that, we give, listen to this church, because it's good for us. Let me be very clear. God doesn't need your money. He doesn't. Why? Because he owns the, the cattle on a thousand hills. If he wants to, he can make money pop out of a fish's mouth. He, He does not need our money. Yet, from the very beginning of the Bible, God has made it clear that he delights when we give. It's because God's not looking for handouts. He wants our hearts. And there's a big idol that prevents us from giving ourselves fully and faithfully to God. And that idol is money because of the security, because of what we think it provides And so when we let go of something that we treasure so much to say, no, we treasure this more, we're communicating both to God and to a watching world that he is more valuable. And you know this to be true. When we give, some way, somehow, God increases our capacity to give. When we love, God somehow, some way, increases our capacity to love. When we had our first child, it was like, how can we possibly love any more than our sweet Makayla boo. And then boom, Titus pops out. Whoa! Expanded on the love. And Judah expanded on the love. God supplies so that we can give more, love more, serve more. And it is a joy to have God increase our capacities. So again, when we are content in Christ and His sovereignty, His sufficiency, we will join others in the fellowship of giving. And it will produce Fruit, and now last and maybe most important, the characteristic of Christian contentment is that our giving is a fragrance act of worship. Look there at verse 18. Paul says this, But I have received everything in full, and I have an abundance. I have been filled 
Having received from Epaphroditus what you sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And I love the, the three words that Paul uses here. And he just, he just piles on the superlative after superlative. He's communicating that it's not just the reception of the gift, but it's the abundance of the gift that's given. And so the first phrase he uses there, he says, I have received everything in full. Just two words in the Greek, and it's commercial language. It's the stamp, paid in full. I've got everything I need. I'm amply supplied. Second, he adds that he actually received more than he respected, expected, certainly more than he thought he deserved. And he says, I abound. I have more than you gave me. And then some, Paul says, that speaks of the extravagance of their generosity. And then lastly, he says in the passive voice, he says, I've been filled with the gas prices that uh, as high as they are, it's very difficult to try to fill up your gas tank. But doesn't it feel so good when the meter goes all the way up to full? Well, Paul says, if I went up to full and it kept going, that is how they provided for brother Paul. They did well to meet his needs. But again, the main concern in expressing his thanks for their financial gift is not really about the amount of money. It's about their attitude. It's about their actions, which pointed to a higher purpose for giving. You see, their stewardship was an act of worship that was offered up to God himself. I really do think that our giving would be dramatically different if Jesus walked from pew to pew with his hands and you saw the nails in his hands. I just think our giving would be different if we were reminded of the great gift that he gave us. Paul wants them to understand that their giving is an act of worship. How do we know that? Well, look at the words that he uses here. Fragrant aroma, acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. Those Old Testament allusions go back to the burnt offering, the grain offering, the peace offering, the sin offering, the guilt offering. You, for homework, you can go read Leviticus chapters 1 through 5 and learn about the offerings that were established in the law of Moses. But those first three offerings, they were voluntary. They were to be offered up to God out of love and gratitude. And what the Bible says is that when those things are offered up, what it does is it provides a sweet-smelling aroma to God's nostrils, that he takes it in. And the Bible says he loves it. It's an act of worship. Listen, church, there's one concept that I think we need to recapture, and it is worship. Well, we talk about it sometimes only as singing. Ah, missing the worship music, worship songs, worship singing. But listen, if you want to get closer to the nature of worship and the meaning of worship, then it would be giving. That's worship. Giving. Giving all that I am because of all who God is and because all that he's done for me. You see, we make sacrifices to show off his worth-ship. Is he worthy? How are you showing that? Giving. Not just treasure, but time, talent, your whole being, are you laying yourself down as a sacrifice because he's worthy? In fact, when you think about the very first act of worship, I want to take you there. Turn to Genesis chapter 4. The very first act of worship ever recorded in Scripture, and it involves giving. And not only did it involve giving, but when you read the text, I think that's all that's involved here. So Genesis 4, two men, you know them very well, two sacrifices being offered up to God. And there's lots of lessons that you can learn. Our kids are learning about Cain and Abel. And there's, hey, don't, don't be jealous. Don't be envious. Uh, don't, don't hate. Don't murder. Don't be dishonest. Don't try to cover up sin. Don't lie to God. All those things are true. But primarily, what is it about? What is the story about? Look at Genesis chapter 4 and verse 4. The Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering, 
But for Cain and for his offering, he had no regard. I think the primary issue here is worship. Worship that's acceptable and worship that is not acceptable. Acceptable worship is not what we determine it to be. God determines what worship is, and what you'll find as you study the topic of worship in the Scriptures, worship is defined by God. It's directed toward God. It is delight in God. It is done in faith, and it is for the display of His glory. Defined by God, directed toward God, It is delight in God, done in faith, and it is done for display of His glory. Worship is, yes, it's corporate, but it's also individual. It could be done, it could be in public, it could be done in private. But true worship, listen to this, it's not merely fulfilling your duty. Worship is not just filling a deep sense of emotion, but rather it always has at its center your heart. And oftentimes, The measure of it comes at the cost. You remember when Jesus planted himself by the offering and he's just watching all these people come and bring their offerings? Guys were putting big bucks in there. But it's the widow who just throws in two little pennies. And he said that she gave out of her poverty and she's actually the one that gave the most because she gave at a cost. Every time you read about sacrifices, You read that an acceptable sacrifice are those that come at a cost and are offered up in gratitude. And an unacceptable sacrifice are those that come at no cost. Whether it's an Old Testament saint purchasing a lamb or an ox to sacrifice, or it's the New Testament saint selling all the property and giving to the furtherance of the gospel. In fact, there's a passage in 2 Samuel. You remember King David is going to buy some land. There's a famine that's going on, a plague that's broke out. And King David goes to purchase the land, and he's told, well, hey, I'll I'll spot you here. I'll give you this. You take it. And what does David say? 2 Samuel chapter 24. He says, no, but I will surely buy it from you for a price. And then he says, for I will not offer burnt offerings to Yahweh my God, which cost me nothing. See, sacrificial giving is always, always a key aspect of our worship. Not because God needs our money, but because we do. And when we offer God our money, it's not because He lacks it, but it's communication to Him that you are more valuable than the things that I possess. I've already got the greatest possession, and that's Christ Jesus. And listen... God's command for us to give is not about the gift. It's all about giving all that we are to God because he's worthy. If you do a study on what pleases God, you're going to find over and over again, it's giving, 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 giving. Let me just show you. What pleases God? You know what pleases him? When you give of your life in consecration to the work of Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, I exhort exhort you, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a sacrifice, living, holy, and pleasing to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. God is pleased, church, when you serve. Romans 14, 17. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who is in this way serves Christ is pleasing to God and approved by men. You want to be pleasing to God? Then you will give of yourself to bear fruit. Colossians 1.10, Paul says this, So that you may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please Him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and multiplying in the full knowledge of God. Another prescription for pleasing God, you want to know what it is? Living by faith. Hebrews 11.6 says, Without faith it is impossible to what? To please Him. For those who come to Him must believe that He is, and He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. 
You want to please God? Then you're going to offer up gratitude. You're going to give your gratitude to him. Hebrews 12, 18. Therefore, since we're receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us show gratitude by which we may offer to God an acceptable service with reverence and awe. You want to know how you could be pleasing to God? You care for one another. Hebrews, I'm sorry, for, uh, yeah, Hebrews 13, verse 16 The writer says this, Do not neglect doing good and sharing, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. Do you want to be pleasing to God? Then you can never divorce obedience. 1 John 3.22 And whatever we ask, we receive from Him, because we keep His commandments and do the things that are pleasing in His sight. Listen, we don't consecrate ourselves to God We don't serve God. We don't bear fruit for God. We don't live by faith for God. We don't express gratitude to God, care for one another for God's sake and obey God's word to be made right with God. We do all those things. Why? Because we already are. We give. We give sacrificially. We offer up our lives because God has given us the greatest gift. That's why we do it. Ephesians 5.1 says, Therefore, be imitators of God. How? How can we imitate God? Well, as beloved children, walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us in offering and sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. So listen, at the end of the day, do we really want to exercise our contentment, display it, show it? Then all we have to do is go back to Jesus and see that he offered up his life. He gave and he gave and he gave. And guess what? He didn't have to. I'm amazed that every time we come to the scriptures in just a few short verses. There's so much truth. It's an ancient thank you note. That's what this is. And yet it is jam-packed with theology, some of the most profound truth, some of the most relevant stuff in the world. And it's not just a book to help us be generous. It's not a rule book to keep us away from greed or covetousness or discontentment or the various idols of the heart. The fact is, It's a love letter to us. And it is a reminder, even this morning, that God has demonstrated the greatest love by sending his son. He became a man. He became a servant. He served you on a cross that you deserved. He died as a substitutionary sacrifice in your place. And he gave you the greatest gift ever. He gave you himself. He gave you eternal life. And if we can look at all that and say, eh, I don't want to give much. I don't think that's the proper response. I think the proper response is not an amount. It's it's all a matter of the heart. But are you giving yourself for gospel advancement? Are you giving your time, treasure, and talent to make much of Christ? And the question I want to leave you with this morning is, is he worth it? I know that you think he is. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we are humbled, maybe challenged, convicted. So Father, we confess even now that there have been times where we just, uh, we want to be the center of the universe. We don't want to give of our time. We, we don't want to serve. We don't want to obey. We want what we want, when we want it, how we want it. And this is why, Lord, we need to keep coming back to the gospel. The gospel isn't just what saves us. Oh, it's true how it saves. But the gospel is what sanctifies us. And it reminds us of the great cost the great price that was paid. And so Jesus, we, we thank you 
for being our Savior, for being our sacrifice. Lord, we recognize that any type of worship that we can offer is only sweet-smelling aroma because it is in Christ. Lord, that is our identity. That is our heritage. That is our covering. And so, Lord, this message is not to try to spank anyone or reprimand anyone or rebuke anyone, but I trust that your Spirit would convince us and compel us to consider how we're offering up worship. Lord, we do not want our worship to be unacceptable in your sight. We could sing, we could sing loud, we can have a flood of tears rolling down our face, but at the end of the day, true worship will come when we give ourselves fully and faithfully to you, however that may seem. And so God, please be our help. Remind us that anything that is not done in faith is sin. Remind us that without faith it is impossible to please you. And now fill us with faith, Lord. We, we want to believe, help our unbelief. Help us to remember that every spiritual investment for the advancement and the furthering of the kingdom will be enjoyed in heaven, but we'll also be able to taste and see some here. And may we do that collectively as a church. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.